I'm Dr. Craig DeLauder from Heart Place in Fort Worth, Texas, and I'm here today on behalf of the Cardiac Rhythm Management Online Clinical Community on CardioSource. I'm joined today by Dr. Martin Burke, uh, who's actually revealing results of a late-breaking clinical trial at the Heart Rhythm Society's 2012 scientific sessions today. Your study, Dr. Burke, was titled Safety and Efficacy of a Subcutaneous Implantable Defibrillator. It's very interesting to see something entirely new at uh, HRS's scientific sessions. Tell us a little about the results of your study. It's my privilege to talk on behalf of the SICD ID investigators for this study. The process of the study actually demonstrated uh, endpoints in safety and efficacy, and we met those endpoints very convincingly. The design of the study enrolled 330 patients at 33 sites, of which 85% of those sites were in the United States. The primary endpoint of VF conversion testing at the time of implant was looked at two consecutive successes out of four at 65 joules. The device treats spontaneous events at 80 joules. The safety endpoint was type one complication free rate at 180 days. Type one complications are device related complications. If you look at the 304 patients who are valuable for the primary endpoint for VF conversion, we were 100% successful. The um, bound of uh, success and the uh, performance goal was 88%. So we met that goal very convincingly. In the safety uh, endpoint, we had a 79% performance goal. And the type one complication free rate at 180 days was 99%. So we very much met that criterion as well. As we move forward, there were a couple of issues that came up with complications. So after we've met the complication free rate, infections and inappropriate shocks were meted out and looked at very, very convincingly. When we looked at that, infections were seen very early. And this was an IDE trial, so when you're looking at an IDE trial, there's a learning curve or lessons learned through that. And all we saw in the first third of the patients were the four patients that needed explant for infection. The last 214 patients that were enrolled did not have any explants for infections. So that brings up some interesting points, right? Um, I think that for most implanting physicians, we've become familiar over the past, you know, many decades now of transvenous system implantation, um, but clearly there are gonna be some differences with this system. So first of all, could you just briefly explain for our viewers where is the subcutaneous system implanted and what are the actual components that are put within the patient? So let's start with the components. The components aren't very different from a standard single coil ICD lead system. And look at the transvenous system that's placed under the clavicle. This is placed very differently where the main can is placed in the left lateral mid axillary line adjacent to the left ventricular apex. And then a lead is tunneled underneath the skin to the left parasternum. On the lead, there's two sensing electrodes, one at the tip that's at about the angle of Louis, and the other that's down by the xiphoid process. Between the two sensing electrodes, there's a coil that's used for shocking vector. The can is active, and the can also senses. So in that capacity, there's three sensing vectors, one that goes from the angle of Louis to the can, one that goes from the xiphoid process to the can, and one between the coils along the parasternum. These three sensing vectors allow for flexibility in sensing and position so that there's a much more robust sensing algorithm with this device. The shocking vector is between the can and the coil across the left ventricular apex. The maximum output and the only output from the device is 80 joules. This device is implanted in a very similar way in a subcutaneous pocket the tunneling is not very difficult. There's three incisions. The first incision is in the inframammary region. The second incision is at the xiphoid process where you actually fixate the lead there for stability. And then that's tunneled up to another incision at the angle of Louis where you actually fixate the lead in that position. So let me ask you a couple of questions about the actual implantation process since you mentioned it. Uh, the fact that there is tunneling involved, I assume means that all these implants would have to be done under general anesthesia, is that correct? Not actually. So during the IDE study, 
the initial implantations were done under general anesthesia in order to take that entire management of the airway out of the picture. But as time went on, investigators started using conscious sedation and local without any difference in outcome. Very interesting. Um, what type of training was necessary for your implanting uh, physicians? Because I'm, I'm certain that there will be a significant level of interest in your technology and there will obviously have to be some uh, updating of skill sets in order to utilize this. I think it's an interesting question, Craig. I think that the process of uh, training is really, as an electrophysiologist, you have all the tools. The main thing that we learned, and when I brought up the infections earlier, why we were able to avoid them later, was that the surgical prep is quite different. And so it's not so much that you're not used to doing a little tunneling, and the space in the tunneling is very short, so it's not as much of a learning curve there. And you know how to make a pocket already because you're an electrophysiologist. So we're really targeting electrophysiologists, mainly because of the tool sets and the experience that they have. I think the surgical prep learning tools that the companies put together are really ideal right now. And I think that the process of training is very simple. I had two junior faculty to watch me do one, and then they did one. It was pretty <laughs> the old easy. See one, do one, teach one type <laughs> it's, algorithm. It's, it's, huh? Yeah, so we go back to our days, right? Right. It was a lot simpler. I want to touch on. You mentioned the um, the output of the device being uh, 65 and 80 joules. Um, clearly, that would mean that charge times would be a little longer. Uh, I know that with a typical transvenous system, we can often get charge times and delivery of therapy in the 10 to 12 second range. How does that compare with this device? That's a great question. I think it's a big issue when you're talking about therapy for ventricular fibrillation. So let me clarify exactly what this device does. It does have a larger capacitor because it has to deliver a bigger energy across the left chest. In that capacity, the sensing algorithm takes about three to six seconds to detect. And then the charge time is nine to 12 seconds. And at end of life, it adds about three seconds. So the maximum would be about 15 seconds. Frankly, the longest charge times and the time to therapy in the IDE trial was not necessarily based on the hardware and the charge time, but actually the sensing algorithm, which is extremely unique and tries to classify the rhythm rather than just be a beat detector. So you're much less likely to get inappropriate shocks, uh, and you're also going to let non-sustained events go forward and not be treated, which actually would be a better thing for the patient. Right, so we have a lot of data from transvenous systems with studies like pain-free or prepare um, that appropriate programming of our current generation of devices um, especially when used in combination with antitachycardial pacing can greatly uh, and significantly reduce um, the delivery of inappropriate and unnecessary shocks. And it sounds like the design of your algorithm has at least attempted to uh, approach that same uh, level of uh, efficacy and avoidance of unnecessary therapy. Um, but ATP is not actually possible with this device, is it? No, it's not. This is a purely shock device. And interestingly, ATP reliably terminated VT was an exclusion criteria for the IDE trial. I see. So in some ways then, um, that might help our viewers understand what type of patients would be most appropriate for this type of device. Maybe you could go into that a little bit. Sure. In the IDE trial, the average age was 52, which is considerably younger than an ICD population that we see today. The demographics on the clinical characteristics demonstrated a heart failure population and hypertensive population, but myocardial infarction, atrial fibrillation, and diabetes were well represented. If you look at the concept of who's indicated for this patient, there are outliers of patients that normally would not be given a transvenous system who were younger, had channelopathies, Brugada, long QT, patients who had congenital heart disease who have very limited vascular access or maybe don't even have a right-sided ventricle. And these are the patients that uh, constituted to lead to the higher ejection fraction than what you saw in traditional ICD trials like made it to in Scud Heft. So the mean ejection fraction in the ID study was 36. So if you look at the major differences, younger age, uh, ejection fractions where they're normal but they have high risk of sudden cardiac death, and the concept here is that patients who are younger, who don't want to have the complications affiliated with transvenous lead systems are ideal. And I don't think there's a, this is not a niche product for indication. 
it's a niche product uh, as an added tool for patients who are at high risk for ventricular tachyarrhythmias who meet guideline indications. One particular population that springs to mind uh, would be patients with end-stage renal disease. You know, we've already seen um, peer-reviewed journal articles showing that the expected mortality benefit that might be present in patients who would otherwise meet criteria for uh, an ICD with a transvenous system, uh, whether they met criteria by MATA2 or by SCUD heft, uh, isn't always um, isn't always present when they have many other comorbidities, including end-stage renal disease. And you might you might propose that complications of vascular access or infection could be part of the issue why that occurs. Um, I know that your study did not particularly address that, but are there plans for perhaps some type of study based on a subpopulation like that in the future? There is definitely discussion as to what's the next study that should be done with this device system and what's come up has been the chronic renal failure, dialysis dependent patients at high risk of sudden cardiac death. Very important point is in the ID trial, there were no episodes of endocarditis with this particular device. The infections were all local infections and were taken care of very easily. The process of, the, of looking at mortality benefit in a chronic renal failure population is rather daunting, but you bring up some really good points of comorbidities, especially the infection and the vascular access issues, and then the complications regarding implantation of a transvenous system is probably higher in that group as well. I do want to ask you, though, about how uh, you as a physician would manage patients who end up having an, uh, a need for some type of pacing. So I think it's easily understood that uh, a younger patient who um, doesn't want to begin having a vascular uh, uh, device uh, implanted uh, might benefit from this uh, subcutaneous system. Uh, but many of our patients, due to either beta blocker therapy or just due to their age developing sinoatrial node dysfunction, ultimately do have an indication for pacing, either atrial, ventricular, or of course, our patients that require CRT therapy. Um, this doesn't really sound like the device that would be appropriate in that situation. No, there's clearly uh, transvenous needs and pacing where you can have combined devices. CRT is an absolute, uh, no, n it's a deal breaker with this particular device in this current generation. I actually think that this is a platform that can be built on and actually could eventually have pacing where there's leadless pacing and the area that's being looked at for leadless pacing is actually right across the left ventricular apex. So I think this is a first generation. This is a platform that could go to that direction, but right now that is not the indication for this device. CRT and if you have guideline indicated bradycardic uh, pacing indications, you should not get this device. If you do, however, get this device and then subsequently need pacing, a pacemaker can be implanted and it can be continued to be sensed without any problem at all, as long as it's not a unipolar pacemaker. Yeah, that makes sense. But in, uh, interesting, I would not have thought of two separate devices. Do you remember when we used to do the two devices, when there wasn't pacing affiliated with uh, ICD, <laughs> it was about 6% of the population that ultimately needed both devices. Interesting. And so it's pretty low, and so I, I'm pretty comfortable when I put in the device. And actually in the ID trial, only one patient went on to CRT Device, had the device explained for CRT, and another patient didn't have a bradycardic indication, but actually had overdrive pacing to suppress PVCs because he was having ventricular storms. Interesting. I've got one final question I want to ask you, and that's really about the perception of the device that patients in your study uh, had. Um, were there any individuals who had previously been implanted with a transvenous system, and if so, what were their comments about having one type of uh, implant versus the other? That's a great question, Craig. And actually, interestingly enough, 13% of the patients who were enrolled in the ID study actually had a prior transvenous ICD lead system. And actually, in that capacity, when you brought up the possibility of them having either a transvenous system or the sub-Q system, they always chose the sub-Q system because they had just gone through an extraction which scared them to death. I see. So you think perhaps that their perception was somewhat skewed by the fact that they'd just gone through extraction of their previous device? It wasn't necessarily an immediate comparison between the implantation process itself? Definitely in that group, the extraction had a lot to do with it. But when you present the 
the uh, data and you look at the demographics, the secondary and primary uh, indications uh, for ICDs uh, were distributed very equally as they are in the ACC NCDR database of nearly 500,000 patients. So we didn't cherry pick patients. And so they had an option to either get in the transvenous system or to go into the ID trial. And they went into the ID trial, which is really amazing. Interesting. Well, I've greatly enjoyed talking with you today and look forward to hearing your presentation at the late breaking clinical trials later this morning. The pleasure was mine, Craig. Thank you. Thank you.